thought leadership from PwC. Today, we're coming to you with a refresher on the current state of play in real estate. This is PwC's accounting podcast. I'm Heather Horn, and thanks so much for joining us today. Real estate touches nearly every aspect of our lives and the economy. And like so many aspects of business, it's subject to the same trends and constraints, economically and socially, that we see driving the broader business environment. But as our guests today will discuss, this is an area ripe for opportunity and forward thinking on the issues that matter most for your business. Bringing together these new data points of of where your people are, where your customers are, where do your where does your operating footprint need to be adjusted, uh, has driven people to think about everything from uh, shrinking or expanding one location to the benefit of another. It's all on the table and there is not one answer. It's got to be designed for each situation so that the operating results can be maximized accordingly. Our guest is Byron Carlock, PwC's U.S. real estate leader. We wanted to bring Byron back on the show to give our listeners not just a business update on where real estate deals are headed in the current environment, but also to take a look at how ESG is impacting the way companies optimize their real estate footprint. Byron's experience is not only broad, but deep, and he cuts through the noise to help our listeners find the key takeaways that may impact your business. Byron, welcome to the podcast. So happy to have you here today to talk about something that I feel like is becoming an increasing topic of conversation, and that would be the intersection of ESG with real estate. And I can't think of the number of buildings I've been in recently where they're touting their certification or otherwise, and and I know it's something a lot of people are focused on. But before we get into some specifics, just from a big picture perspective, what are some of the key trends you're seeing since last time you were on, which has actually been more than a year ago? It was July 2021. Well, Heather, what a difference a year makes. And thanks for having me today. It is, it is an interesting time indeed for the entire real estate sector. Because a year ago, of course, we were not talking about inflation. We were not talking about increased interest rates. And inexpensive capital is the real estate industry's best friend. And so we've seen the cost of capital double and in some case, cases triple since we were last together. So that's probably the hottest topic. I think that inflation, interest rates, Supply chain and ESG are going to be our top um, priority topics as we look at emerging trends 2023. We're finishing up our editorial cycle now, but I continue to hear those themes come up in, in our personal interviews with um, the C-suite around the world. And it's a different time and it's a fast, it's a fast change that we're quickly adapting to. Yeah, and it's interesting, even just uh, walking around the streets like for in New York, for example, you're seeing a lot less vacancies. Is that imagination or are we really seeing less vacancies broadly, either here in New York or, you know, across the country? Well, Heather, that's a great question as it relates to your observations of New York, because I think the boomerang has been most obvious in New York. And I think with some of the financial services companies putting their foot down earlier than other industries for folks to return to the office, that accelerated that. And it accelerated the return back to apartments and apartment rents, as you read, are above Mm pre-pandemic levels. Vacancy is still struggling in some of the storefront retail and office occupancy varies by day, as you can imagine. We'll talk about Mm -hmm. that, I'm sure, um, in a little in a little while. But uh, generally, New York is an exception. I was um, in San Francisco this week with clients and San Francisco is still pretty surprisingly shut down with more remote work than in-person work with the desire of our clients that I visited with there wanting to see people come back to the office, uh, but they have not been very forceful about it like we've seen in New York with the financial services industry. So then you look at places like Dallas, Houston, and Austin, where uh, it's as though the pandemic lived the shortest amount of time and folks are, are um, office occupancy is climbing uh, in those cities probably more rapidly. But I think one thing that we're observing, Heather, is that regardless of the city, um, remote work and flexibility uh, is now part of our, our work lifestyle. Uh, it's okay to be gone from the office when you need to be. But I'm 
observing now the desire to return to the office, uh, it's going to be a both and not either or phenomena. We're going on our third year of our youngest associates having no one-on-one -on -one mentoring, no training, no teaching, but for Zoom conversations. And that's not nearly um, as effective as the surprising osmosis that one gets by hanging out around the coffee pot and running into people in the hallways. Um, you and I are of an age that we take that for granted, but it's truly been an absence in work-life behavior. And a, a screen interface only does a portion of what one needs when it comes to mentoring, training, product introduction, um, new business planning, whiteboarding, brainstorming, the energy of an in-person meeting to accomplish some very important tasks simply cannot be easily replicated on the screen. Would you agree with that? I've been nodding frantically for our viewers' uh, benefit because I am definitely personally someone who likes to go to the office. I would say five days a week, eight hours a day is probably a bit much. And I think that's probably where you, you know, you are seen too, is I think people want the best of both. So sometimes to stay home and, you know, get the benefits of that. And then otherwise, I do think the energy of being in the office and, you know, running into people you wouldn't expect to otherwise, or even I was in the office last week and someone said, Oh, have you met so-and-so come along, you know, to this meeting with me that, that just doesn't happen. Um, you know, that would not have happened over, over a zoom call. So, uh, I definitely see the benefits. 100%. And Heather, there's one thing that we're not talking enough about, and that is cultural stickiness. So at this time of a, an economy that's really, I think we could say is at full employment, uh, there's there's a shifting dynamic back to some employer leverage, but I'm seeing that change. I think there is this desire to be in. And as it relates to real estate, the the office environment is changing to adapt to the way we use office. So there is a new um, energy around going to the office that increases our socialization, our time to convene in um, whiteboard sessions and business planning sessions and team meetings. I was with a CEO of one of our office funds, I, I guess it was two weeks ago, and he said, my loading dock looks more like a furniture store than it does an office building because so many of our occupants are changing their furniture to, begin, to feel more living room-like and less cubicle-like. And so I think people are adapting the way we use the walls of our space to increase this collaboration time. So then are you seeing that companies are reducing their footprint because they don't need as much space all the time or are they just reconfiguring the space they have? Or I'm sure it's some combination of all of those. Since the beginning of time in the real estate industry, we've been in the business of building cathedrals for Easter Sunday. So <laughs> I, th I think there is there's a quest now for efficiency. And for, so mm -hmm. and for some people, that means less space and they're able to um, change the way they use certain spaces, but we're seeing some of those same users um, move to hub and spoke models. So they might have a, a luxury class A urban location where people are gathering for their urban meetings, and then two, three, or four suburban locations that are closer to where people live, where they can still go in for meetings, but not have to go all the way into the city. And I think that's also being reflected in the way we're using ma mass transit. I think there is more activity happening in suburban locations than going all the way into urban locations in our top 30 cities. This is an obvious evolution. Some of this office transformation activity had already begun uh, before the pandemic, and this really accelerated our behaviors. And to your point about ESG, ESG is going to drive even more change going forward as we have to delineate between the buildings that are relevant by new ESG standards and those buildings that are irrelevant. You mentioned a moment ago that uh, you've heard office owners and landlords uh, tout their ESG sensitivity, their air quality, their sanitation. Mm -hmm. There's a real bifurcation between those buildings that have risen to those new standards and are measuring those and those buildings that are either behind or have delayed uh, enactment of those uh, standards, ranging from energy management systems to air quality systems to measurement systems that let them know how they're doing uh, by these. And with the uh, SEC requiring disclosure for those, 
in uh, public situations, we're going to see more focus on that. 80% of our office stock was built in the 80s or before. And so you can imagine that some of it has obviously fallen into irrelevance. And it will either have to be upgraded or in more dire situations, demolished and redeveloped. So as we think about those SEC proposed rules, are you seeing then the owners of the buildings, are they more concerned about their own disclosures of, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and otherwise, or are they concerned tenants are not going to want to move into their buildings if they are not taking actions to make them more inefficiency, energy efficient and the like? It's an excellent question. We're actually behind in the U.S. So it's no surprise. And everyone talks about the fact that the real estate industry is one of the largest contributors uh, to carbon production uh, mm -hmm. through uh, carbon um, creation from concrete and steel and construction processes, especially. And so the, there is a big eye on the real estate industry. Landlords uh, are really responding not only to disclosure pressures and learning how to measure their carbon footprint, but uh, tenants and investors are requiring more disclosure around the ESG topic. It's a much more mature discussion in Europe, as you've pointed out in previous podcasts. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, there is a, a gradation schedule of buildings. And if they fall below a certain grade, they are in France, for example, um, tagged and not use, not usable, not leasable, not saleable, not financeable until remediated. We're not there yet in the U.S., but I think we're on a path for more stringent uh, application of standards and will be measured by everything from GRI and Gresby standards mm -hmm. to uh, Well Building Institute standards. It's, it's spawning a new industry to be responsive for people to be able to know what they should be disclosing and how they should be disclosing it and benchmarks against which they are disclosing it. So you raised an interesting point on, you talked about construction and steel. And I think, you know, historically, let's talk about the U.S., there has definitely been oh, you know, there's a building, it's obsolete, I'm going to knock it down, build something brighter, newer, shinier, bigger in its place. And do you see a change in trend to more, as you mentioned, you know, in Europe with the tagging, like retrofitting and, you know, reuse of existing space, or we're not quite there and we're still in a, a build, a build new cycle? No, no, I think this is a from a cost perspective and an ESG perspective, it's typically more effective to redevelop than to ground up new develop. And I think where situations can be repurposed, we are seeing great interest in that. In this particular financial and capital markets environment, a lot of that is slowing down because interest rates have gone up and many deals just simply do not pencil out with the higher cost of money. That will also cause people to rethink the way they use their four walls. And I think we will probably see greater um, efficiency in the deployment of capital as we still move down this path of redeveloping our built environment in most of our major cities. We, we have to continue that because some of our built environment, as we've seen through infrastructure, is obsolete or in disrepair. And so th this is a great season for rethinking how we use space across all the different product utilizations and that we do it more efficiently and that we do it inside a belt of uh, improved ESG related standards. And when I say ESG related standards, that's mostly focused on E related measurement. Real estate also bleeds into the S in a big way as we think to, about also addressing uh, the way our neighborhoods flow into live, work, walk environments, the way we are improving access for home occupancy and ownership, rentership across uh, affordability classes, workforce housing, related um, health care real estate uses, the changing transformation of the way we use retail space. Uh, this is a timely era, probably not as grand of an era that we've seen since post-World War II, where we're rethinking our built environment, integrating it better into transportation modalities, uh, moving toward the popular phrase, the 15 or 20 minute lifestyle, where everything you need in your life from your dog park to your grocery store, to your work environment, to your living environment is within a 15 or 20 minute grasp. Uh, and and that, that is the preference. That's a societal preference and it's a behavioral preference. And our built environment is adapting to that. 
Yeah, it's interesting. There's so many follow-up questions to that point. I, but one, maybe talking specific on the social, I know one of the issues is just housing and availability of housing and real estate development and the like. And I read actually an interesting article this morning, again, talking about New York, that was talking about how existing housing is being torn down to make room for new, I'll call it, quote, improved housing, but then the number of units being put in is much less than the existing units. And so, you know, that, if you think about density and otherwise, it's not a positive. But more broadly, are you seeing more density as there is more of a push to public transportation and, to your point, this, you know, 20-minute lifestyle? Well, density is always the cure for that issue. And I think we're paying the price for probably too much suburban sprawl in the four decades after the after World War II, believing that ring road expansion was the way to grow our cities, improve the lives of our population. And it, it's pushed us into this um, environmental consciousness of too many cars on the road. And density is really the only solution uh, for that. And when you f have a good site and you can increase density, you can also house more people, obviously. And... If it's programmed appropriately at the street level, it adds to the quality of that 15 or 20 minute lifestyle because everything you need uh, is within a reasonable distance. So I think the short answer to what you just asked is yes. Uh, the cost answer is it's difficult because we have to rethink and replan entire sections and quadrants of our cities. And then for those that are not within the urban core, we have to make sure there is um, transportation accessibility in and out. And I think we can take some great lessons from what's happened in and around London as they have uh, improved rail service all the way out to cities, Cambridge, Manchester, Birmingham. Uh, I was there, uh, I guess, last, about six weeks ago and was surprised to see uh, the number of our own associates that live um, in major cities outside of London but have great transportation into the city. And I think we, we're behind in that. There's a uh, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, that plans appear to be moving forward with the Texas high-speed rail connectivity between Dallas and Houston. There's always talk of uh, reigniting that same opportunity between L.A. and San Francisco, Orlando and Miami. I wouldn't Miami. Put, place my bets on that one, but, <laughs> but it would be nice. <laughs> well, it's, it's one of those projects that's supposedly partially funded in the state budget. Yes. We'll see if it ever happens. <laughs> exactly. You know, one thing that's also interesting is you talk about sort of changing infrastructure, but I do think there's also an element of changing people's expectations in terms of are they going to hop in a car? Are they going to take public transport or walk? And, I, you know, I see that in a microcosm because I both my kids are in college now and they walk everywhere or they take the bus everywhere. But you get them at home, man, like, mom, can you take me? Blah, blah. <laughs> mom, can I use the car? I'm like, you would easily be walking if, you know, you didn't have that access. And I, I do think that's the case more broadly as people, you know, have different views on how far they're going to walk, when they're going to take public transport or otherwise. And so just some changing, I guess, societal views are also going to be needed as well as changes to the infrastructure and otherwise. Right. Well, I mean, you think about your two lives. You live in L.A., which is a car city, and you live, yes. in, you live in New York, which is a walking city. Um, and I think... What we are adapting to as we continue down this path of transformation is realizing that it is both preferable in many cases and healthier if we're getting our steps in and walking. And it's certainly more environmentally appropriate. Uh, and the, t the road rage and the difficulty of being in a car in many cities is, is not pleasant. We're getting closer to the day where we'll have driverless cars. We're seeing more e-bikes and scooters on the road, um, different modes of transportation. I think the big dollars, though, will continue to be needed for more remote tr remote connectivity through mass transit on rail and natural gas buses and things like that. So let me rewind a little because you started talking about deals and the impact of the current environment. And I do want to, to come to that. But you actually make me think of another question which is, you know, if I'm a large real estate developer or own buildings or otherwise, we've talked briefly here about all these differences among all those different cities. And obviously, the majority of our listeners are not in the real estate industry. But I do still think it's an interesting question or challenge how 
does the industry deal with the differences in lifestyle and zoning and expectations in um, infrastructure and people returning to the office? Like all of these differences really must create a challenge as you are trying to develop a, a strategy. 100%. And I think different different pockets of the industry are responding differently. In the housing area, you see the growth of um, build to rent communities that give people the opportunity to live as though they own a home, but they're renting it in a neighborhood. And um, there's a, there's a lifestyle for whatever uh, pocketbook you have or whatever life you want or whatever location you want to uh, choose to live in. But the zoning rules in our cities, which is generally a municipality driven uh, authority, are in many cases outdated and are having to be changed to adapt to the behaviors you were just mentioning. Um, gated communities, um, zoning, you know, minimum lot size. We're seeing uh, developers come together to educate city planners and, and zoning regulators about the benefits of mixed use, the benefits of density. Some cities have passed ordinances that allow one single family home to be torn down and four townhomes be built. That's called three, three for one and, and four for one uh, zoning. There's a gradual breakdown of, of NIMBYism and the new, and the new term YIMBYism. Yes. In my backyard, uh, let, let's do that. And so, uh, there's a group of developers in DC that have formed a coalition called up for growth that are helping educate, uh, zoning, planning officials, variance governance officials uh, on, on these benefits, and frankly, taking us toward, there's an old book that many real estate developers use called A Pattern Language that takes the old techniques of city development and people congregation, if you will, from European development practices and realizing that we probably should have done more of that after World War II instead of the suburban sprawl that we have pursued. And so there are there are answers in history, and we're trying to revisit some of those. So then I asked you that question from the perspective of a real estate developer, but now let's look at it from a perspective of CFO. So maybe I have workforces in different cities. Maybe I am just in one city, but whether I'm spread out or not, I'm likely dealing with all of these factors we talked about, maybe distant housing, maybe public transportation is good. Maybe it's not. Maybe my people want to come into work. Maybe they don't. Maybe the nature of my work needs more people congregated. Maybe I feel more comfortable, you know, doing a lot of video work. Like there's so many different trends right now in how people are working and how people are coming together. As you're talking to CFOs and they're thinking about their space strategy, what are some of the things that they should be thinking about? Well, the funniest meetings are when you get the CFO who wants to cut costs in the same room with the chief talent officer or the CHRO <laughs> and that's trying to keep the people um, hired, hired and retained. Yes, the, exactly. The, pan <laughs> the pandemic uh, implicitly gave permission for everyone to live where they want to live. And mm -hmm. then, it, then it put the burden on the CHRO and the CFO to figure out, number one, how to pay for this mobility and number two, how to keep people happy. And I think we're seeing uh, both and again. Uh, mm -hmm. The um, I think we're seeing more people demand uh, the desire for folks to get together on a regular schedule. For some people, it's to your point of five days a week. That's the smallest right now, probably yes. <laughs> probably twenty percent. Uh, then there's probably the bell curve of forty to fifty percent that is looking at uh, two or three days a week. It looks like three is the magic number. And folks are coming in from further distances for those mandated uh, meetings. Uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the New York area, we saw people move way out into the suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, the concentration of business leaders living in the Hamptons during the pandemic or down at Palm <laughs> Beach uh, was, was, was significant. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we've uh, documented the Florida exodus uh, from New York, it was also significant. Uh, the exodus to Texas uh, for high uh, high tax uh, residents and to Florida and to Tennessee was significant. Some have boomeranged back, some have not, and many companies are adapting to that longer distance um, employee. So you're seeing folks broken down into categories of those that are absolutely necessary to be in the office all the way to the spectrum of we don't care if you stay remote. Mm-hmm. 
in that, we're also seeing the growth of some rural and, and far suburban communities that we thought before the pandemic were dying. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's interesting because that also takes some of the pressure off of the housing stock that was underutilized in some of those more remote locations. And so we're watching all of those data points while still trying to help people. And this is a big consulting area for our occupier services practice right now to align the real estate strategy with the operating strategy, with the people strategy, with the technology strategy. Now, some folks call that transformation. I avoid that word because our clients think it sounds awfully expensive. Yes. <laughs> but it's the re- And yeah, not like something real is going to happen. It's more like a gloss. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. But all all four of those attributes of running a business have to come together. Mm-hmm. And it, and I'm I'm suggesting there are new realities post pandemic that required greater focus on those four areas to make sure that the enterprise advances. Mm-hmm. So to your point, then, if I have a work for us that I do want to see in person because they need training and, you know, there, there are benefits from bringing people together, but I also have a workforce that's spread out all over the country. And I also have all of these different competing priorities, trying to align all those pieces in a way that sort of maximize benefit for all of them is, can be very is a challenge and probably one we were not talking about in 2019. That is so true. And we've actually started service offerings to respond to that. We have in our real estate consulting practice a, a geospatial capability that helps companies understand where where their employees are living, where, where are they keystroking, and where are their customers? Did their customers migrate? And so bringing together these new data points of of where your people are, where your customers are, where do your where does your operating footprint need to be adjusted, uh, has driven people to think about everything from uh, shrinking or expanding one location to the benefit of another. I mentioned hub and spoke strategies before. Uh, it's it's all on the table, and there is not one answer, Heather. It's got to be designed for each situation so that the operating results can be maximized accordingly. So then if I'm that CFO that wants to save costs and I'm pacing my office on Monday and noticing most of the offices are empty, and then I'm pacing my office on Friday and I'm finding much the same thing, but then on Wednesday I'm bursting at the seams, how do you kind of reconcile that need for such varying amounts of space? Again, assuming you do have that type of workforce that can work some remote. Obviously, we've talked about this before on the podcast. Lots and lots of workers were barely remote, are unable to be remote. And so this is really just focusing on that sort of traditional office worker. So I think the first thing to do is put a put a, a banner over the exercise of let's make it fun and let's make it relevant. So if they're crowded on Wednesdays, let's hire two food trucks to go out on the street and ease some of the congestion and have an outdoor or collaborative gathering, or let's let's have lunch together in a rented space down the street. But b- by all means, let's celebrate that they're all together on that crowded <laughs> okay, Wednesday, fair right? Point. Okay, fair point, yes. Now, if they're not coming in on Mondays and he's concerned that he's got a bunch of empty space and he'd like to see some functions, well, then let's have... Um, you know, yoga for the finance department, or let's, let's have, um, a Zumba class for marketing and let's, let's do things that bring people in for a reason to come in. And you're, and you're not just coming in and interrupting your workflow for the face of, I think the idea of FaceTime that many of us grew up with has diminished in value. When, when you are working and we saw this in the pandemic, our productivity went up, but we were also required to be on screen you know, mm-hmm. 14 to 18 hours a day I know, sometimes. It's miserably. It went up miserably. Right? Yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. So, and so you realize that it's got, there's got to be a balance to get the job done, but also keep the people engaged. And with that, you know, you, you may be tempted to slash your office needs, sla- mm-hmm. slash your occupancy budget. Yeah. Well, that's why I asked the question, actually, because I'm the CFO thinking, I don't need all this space. So I gave an interview recently and I said, I'm, wa- yeah. I'm watching the spectrum of the, uh, enlightened culture builders mm-hmm. and the desperate cost cutters. Yes, and, exactly. And they're on both ends of a, they're on both ends of a barbell, and in the middle somewhere is an answer that keeps people engaged and keeps the organization productive. And it's it, somewhere on that spectrum, everyone has to find their position. 
All right. Well, definitely a lot to think about there. And I do think um, it's so interesting thinking of how real estate impacts workforce life and other things. Because I think sometimes people just think of, oh, we're going to talk about real estate on the podcast. You're talking about just, you know, an empty shell. And there's really so much more to it. And I think that's the point you're making. A hundred percent. Heather, it's, this is really a time to rethink the way we use space, the, the way we use our space in our homes. Where, where do you park that laptop for your home office designation? The way you engage in your work hours, either in front of a screen or with people when you're in the office. That's why we're seeing so many living room collaborations. We're seeing conference rooms get expanded. We're seeing food service areas grow. We're seeing in-office catering and food truck use and uh, uh, off-site use grow because we have to use space differently. It's not just having... Uh, a cubicle that you order from your contract furniture maker. Uh, it's about what's happening to create energy in your enterprise. So if you are, I, I still want to get to deals, but let's finish this conversation first. So if you are talking to that CFO and they are kind of saying, okay, I'm looking ahead for the next five to 10 years, what I'm going to do about my office space, how I'm going to configure it, how I'm going to think about my hybrid work, all of these different things, what are some of the key pieces of advice you're giving them in terms of how to approach space now or real estate needs now? So uh, my first advice is know your facts and don't just speculate. Uh, and I'm, I'm always telling people, let's first look at your current state footprint and let's reevaluate where your people are and where your customers are, where your executives live, who you want in the office, who you don't mind if they don't come in the office. And let's design an optimal work environment that meets an optimal living environment. And sometimes, sometimes what we have is just right. Sometimes we see where the deficiencies are and we can adapt. That's my first point of advice. Number two is give people a reason to want to be together, both from a space configuration to a cultural uh, gathering consideration. So that's why you're seeing, you know, better coffee, more food service, more, more, more activities that bring people together. Uh, and, th and those, those sound trite and, and simple, but they really make a difference when, no, I mean, we were, I was in our office in New Jersey this week and there was a food truck and the office managing partner told me that was the most people that had been there since the pandemic started. Oh my so, goodness. And there are, yeah, it makes a difference. There is cultic following to certain food trucks. And, it, yes, and, when, exactly. and, and when that truck's there on Tuesday, you can guarantee your population is going to be higher. There you go. So sorry, I interrupted you. So you gave us two, any other points you'd be telling the CFO? Uh, yes, that it's not necessarily about cost cutting. And I have, I have begun to see some CHROs say, this is about workforce environment that bleeds into our HR strategy as much as it is dollars and cents associated with price per square foot. And it's, a, it's, it's showing itself back in the tie to ESG, the, what I call the techno A plus buildings. And the most recent example that everyone's talking about is one Vanderbilt in New York across the street from our office mm -hmm. next to Grand Central. It is, it is an A plus plus technologically savvy ESG leading building in the city. And, and the landlord is getting full credit for that. The highest, I believe it's, I believe it's the highest rents in the city. Uh, I don't want to misquote, but, I, uh, but I'm, I continue to hear that. And so tenants are willing to pay for that, to deliver that experience to their people. So it's not just the dollars and cents of one's occupancy and how it, it's how it relates to your people strategy and your ESG strategy. And that's where the triangle comes together. Yeah, it's funny. I even like that building because they've made it much nicer to go down into the subway. Sure. So there's lots. I mean, it, it's really a fair point, though, that they, you know, you can make a transformation from that. So it sounds like the days of um, thinking about real estate is just where can I get the best plot of suburban land that's going to be the cheapest that I can house my people. The, those that we are not in that uh, cycle anymore. It sounds like. I think this is this next cycle, Heather, is about rebuilding our built environment to meet current lifestyle needs and improved ESG standards. And then if you have that, um, again, the CFO who's looking at his real estate or her real estate and says, hmm, you know, I have a 10 year lease. I know my landlord's not going to let me break it. I'm just going to wait and deal with this problem later. 
That sounds like a huge miss, just given this intersection with workforce and otherwise. Well, then at least go buy a better coffee machine and put some good art on the walls, <laughs> and, and and maybe you know bring in a few plants. I mean, let's we, we can. <laughs> I promise you, there's a payback on improving your workforce environment. All right, that's an excellent point. All right, I've said this about five times because we started this podcast talking about the broader deal environment and just what's going on from an interest rate perspective, economic perspective, and you mentioned the fact that some deals aren't looking, you know, as as profitable as they may have. So as we just think about going back to the the real estate more commercial real estate more broadly, what are some of the things you're seeing in terms of deals and new construction or, you know, otherwise? Well, there's probably an overreaction disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street. In in real, going into the pandemic, we were already undersupplied in many asset categories, namely the housing related ones. And so the demand on the street for certain asset types related to housing and industrial distribution, and I would probably add many elements of healthcare real estate as well, still need um, financing and attention, but the capital markets are taking a breather and the cost of accessing those has gone up two or three times. And so that's only going to exacerbate the demand needs and we're going to create more inflation by not having enough product to satisfy the changing demand patterns. So that's that's probably the biggest issue. But I do think our industry is working hard to respond, uh, and the better deals will get done. Uh, we continue to see private equity with lots of dry powder approaching $400 billion, with a lot of room to uh, do everything from put more equity into deals and be willing to underwrite with less financing if the numbers pencil out, uh, to uh, taking public companies private that don't have access to public capital. And we've seen some of our clients doing a lot of that over the last few months. And um, I think as it relates to complying with ESG, I think one of the few sources of capital that's still available is green bonds. We do see clients accessing green bonds to, do, to accomplish their ESG objectives. And so I'm hoping that the finance markets are able to um, reopen so that we see securitizations vibrant again, we see syndications vibrant again. But the asset inflation and the high prices probably needed a little relief and we're letting some air out of those tires and the better deals I'm hoping will get underwritten and will still get uh, built. And then um, it's sort of a related question is obviously we saw that the Inflation Reduction Act um, passed in August and huge number of climate funding in there, $370 billion. And uh, most of the, you know, focused on things like renewable energy and otherwise, has any of that had an impact on, from a real estate perspective, maybe, I don't know, buildings looking at solar or, you know, any, anything or, or not directly? No, no. I think in talking to our, our tax partners and our policy partners, one of the key provisions in that act, which is still arguably maybe not an Inflation Reduction Act, but that's a, that's a bottle of wine discussion. <laughs> that's a separate, <laughs> right? yes. <laughs> but um, uh, is that the energy credits that come from application uh, of uh, solar and renewable technology into one's real estate project are now transferable. And so that's important because some entities like REITs can't always use tax credits because mm -hmm. they're not taxpayers. But they can still use those credits in doing their underwriting and then sell those credits, and that becomes um, a reduction in their cost of the development. So I think that's probably the most important provision that I would point out. Uh, and the other is what didn't make the bill that almost did, and that was additional taxation on carried interest. And the real estate industry is built on the entrepreneurship of sponsors and developers that, mm -hmm. that work for that promote. And if it's going to be uh, taxed at ordinary income rates, that takes a lot of the motivation out. And so that did not go into the bill. And so from a real estate perspective, that was probably uh, one of the better news items uh, out of that legislation, that it did not happen. Mm, interesting perspective there. So then, uh, Byron, we've kind of bounced around. We've hit a lot of topics. Any other points you were hoping to make today or any final thoughts for the audience? 
we are still a safe haven for global investment. I was just mm. uh, I was just with um, an audience of near over three trillion dollars of, of foreign investors last week, wow. and and I, in in visiting with them, I think we are still a favored domicile for continued investment and inflow, uh, despite some of the chaos we read in the headlines. There mm -hmm. there is demand that justifies the investment, and there is product that is needed. There is housing that is needed. Our supply chain continues to be um, improving, albeit gradually, but we are seeing onshoring of, 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 uh, manufacturing and distribution that had previously been offshore. And that only adds to the need for more industrial space. I do think inflation is here and higher interest rates are here. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to cause some deals to not be underwritten as we discussed, but hopefully the better ones will get done, but it will slow development. And so I don't see a short and quick fix, uh, to the housing shortage. Mm -hmm. except for the fact that remote work is allowing people to live further out and, and there is housing in some of the wrong places, if you will. So <laughs> may, uh, ESG requirements will continue to evolve our industry's thinking. And I think we're getting better at it, even though in the U.S. we've been slow to that party. And we'll continue to rethink our built environment with the intersection of real estate investment, redevelopment of existing space, public-private partnerships, philanthropic contributions to infrastructure, all with the desire of making our built environment more livable, workable, and walkable. And some of our progress will be, will be plagued by, um, you know, depolarization, I mean, depolarization politically and the deglobalization of our economy. But um, I'm bullish on real estate. History tells us that in times of inflation, real estate remains a safe place to be because we can see, touch it, feel yes. it, and raise our rents. And so I think um, that's why we're seeing our clients increase their allocations to the real estate space. Yeah, well, Byron, definitely a number of interesting points. And I think in particular, something I haven't personally focused on before is just the intersection of how real estate really does impact everything thing about our lives. I mean, it makes sense. You live in a house, you go to an office and you spend time on the streets and in stores, but it definitely seems like there's a lot from um, a public policy and otherwise in terms of it, if how real estate is impacting us. So definitely an interesting time for you to be in that industry. It's a fun industry within which to function. Thank you, Heather. Yes. Well, as always, pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. That's our show for today. Tune in next week for more new episodes. And to make sure you never miss any of those episodes, follow the PwC County Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. To stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.